Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have Paranjay Guhathakurta with us. We are going to discuss a rather tricky issue, the Supreme Court's Expert Committee's 173-page report on the Adani issue. Essentially, it was supposed to look at SEBI. Did it do its due diligence properly about such transactions? And therefore, give us a view whether there were any regulatory failures and if regulatory failures took place, what can be done about it? So, if we look at the report, like most of you might have read, it's very difficult to understand what the report really says. So, we'll have to decipher the report with Poranja Yu. But before that, I would say that one observation of the report, I think is very important, that what is the letter of the law and what is the spirit of the law? And I think those two elements, I think, is something that we need to discuss. And if, if this investigations of SEBI is going nowhere, do we need to look at the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, or do we need to look at what other measures we need to have in order to really address the basic question? Where Adani shares in play by essentially what are called Adani group and related parties, playing on the stock market to raise their shares, use their shares to raise capital. And this is the Hindenburg attack, that these were related parties, they were really playing the stock market in order to raise their share value and use that for fi further financing. Poranjar, TLDR version, too long, don't read 173 pages. <laughs> so give us what is the short version, what do you think is the core of the report? That's not easy to summarize. The 173-plus page report is not easy to summarize. Before that, thank you very much for calling me here. It's been really a long, long time, several years, since we've sat here and discussed India's best-known oligarch, the Adani, Mr. Gautam Adani. Now, what had happened is, after the 24th of January, when the Hindenburg research came out, the market prices of the Adani Group shares collapsed. It was a precipitous decline. And even as we talk from the prices that prevailed before the 24th of January till now, as we talk the middle of May, it's still around half, roughly half. It's gone up, gone down, but that's it. Within a few weeks, uh, barely uh, less than a month and a half, the Supreme Court appointed a committee of experts to examine what was its remit. This committee is supposed to determine whether or not there had been regulatory failure on the part of SEBI. What is SEBI? The Securities and Exchange Board of India, which is the regulator of the country's financial markets. It was also said you recommend ways in which its conduct, its regulatory oversight can be improved. Now, on various occasions, this report of experts, headed by a retired judge of the Supreme Court, it pays lip service to the limitations of its remit. But as our discussion will progress, I will argue, and this is on the basis of analyses done by the Bloomberg columnist Andy Mukherjee and my colleague Abir Das Gupta, they point out that this particular, you know, you, the, this committee has exceeded its rem remit. It's, in a sense, trying to uh, tell the Supreme Court of India how it should interpret precisely what you said, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Well, I, I will say that since I've also looked at the report, though not as detailed as you have, that that's an interpretation because the expert committee is only supposed to help the Supreme Court reach a judgment. It is not in lieu of Supreme Court's judgment. Okay, so it's only supposed to therefore give a basis. What it has said, and again the question that comes up, is on the issue of what is a related party and how does SEPI determine the related parties. Now why is it important? The first thing is it's important because if your friends and relations hold 75% or more of the shares of a company, 
by Sebi's definition, it's therefore not a public limited. It's not a public limited public traded listed company. Com publicly company. listed company. Public right. listed company. That means a minimum of the 25% of the shares has to be held in the hands of the public. Public. Like. And that is supposed to ensure that you don't play with your own shares. And therefore, the, these these kind of uh, regulations To, to use Sebi's language, fair price discovery. Fair price discovery. Okay, that's a good one. Fair price discovery. That means you play with your shares. The prices are not going to be fair. If fair price discovery, fair price discovery therefore means that there should be a certain number of shares in public hands for the trading and the price determination to be fair. Now, what is the problem in uh, determining who are the what would be called the related parties. Because obviously a number of companies hold stocks and the number I think is 12 or 13, uh, which are the funds which hold the stocks. And there are 42 investors who have invested in these funds. So the question is 42, 13, 12 plus 1 I think. Yeah, so, okay. So, okay. so what does these numbers indicate and what is the SEBI investigating before we come to the uh, committee. All right. So, at the heart of the allegations that have been leveled by Hindenburg Research are a clutch of 13 entities. 12 of them are what are essentially called fund managers. I mean, by and large, they are funds. And there is also a a, 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 a financial company, uh, uh, an offshore financial company, 12 funds and one overseas financial. Now, these firms have invested heavily in Adani Group companies. Also, there are 42 names and they are called contributories to the assets under management. And it's interesting, their names are also known. Okay. We, we, I mean, all of this has been given by SEBI to the committee. Their names are there in that report, in that 176-page report. They include, for instance, and my pronunciation may be all wrong, so the viewers may please excuse me, Alistair Guggenbuhl even Switzerland, Jean Schielings, Netherlands, Raj Bhatt, United Kingdom, Yajja Deo Lotun, Mauritius, Adel Hassan Ahmed Alali, United Arab Emirates. So they are there. The question is, are these entities proxies for the Adhari group? This is the heart of the debate and the discussion. Now what we find is, to understand that, we have to, there are three, two key terms. One is related party. Who is a related party? And then is, as we, as you already mentioned, the minimum public shareholding. What we find is that what the committee points out is SEBI itself has changed its own definition of who or what is a related party and eventually bring it. When did they change this definition? There have been several changes including in 2019 and to bring them in line with the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, PMLA. Now, the crucial point is that the disclosure requirements under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act are less strict than those that were earlier prescribed by SEBI in its rules governing foreign portfolio investors or FBIs. I'll summarize this. The rules governing foreign portfolio investors, they were structured in such a way that every controlling interest in a particular entity, a foreign portfolio investor, had to be captured in a decl declaration of beneficial ownership. So the, it was the fund manager all the way to those who have stakes in the fund. And who are these owners? Who are the beneficial owners? Now, instead of going that way, what happens is, the definition of a beneficial owner under the PMLA, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, does not require such a detailed dis disclosure. That means the funds can get away by saying, just naming their fund managers. So this is <coughs> essentially the 
crux of the issue. And you know, uh, just to barge in at this point, the purpose of Money Laundering Act is different from the purpose of regulating the market. Therefore, to have changed this seems to be a dilution because what you're trying to see is that the average share, those who play in the share market, they should have protection. And the protection is related parties do not control 75% or more. So therefore, to put a criminal law requirement, which obviously has to be much more strict because you don't want anybody to go into because of these reasons, there must be real money laundering for take to take place. So this seems to be uh, a weakening of Sebi's remit Absolutely. of being able to look into related parties. In fact, the whole issue is here of related parties. Okay. Here, let me quote what my colleague Abir Das Gupta has pointed out. The committee holds that since these funds were compliant on paper, the SEBI's investigations into whether these funds were act ultimately acted as proxies of the Adani group is a matter of whether the spirit of the law has been violated or the letter of the law. Now, the question is, while the committee, this committee declines to comment on the findings of the ongoing investigations that are going on, it seems to have formulated a legal opinion that could end up invalidating whatever findings. So the question is, even if SEBI succeeds in unearthing a money trail, which shows or indicates that the Adani group's money that this money came back to India, essentially what we call round tripping. Since these firms were compliant with the PMLA's definition of beneficial ownership, no. So the question is, is the committee expressing an opinion on the law? Should this not be the remit of the Supreme Court of India? Yeah, I think that, again, those who are interpreting it this way, I could give an alternate interpretation that essentially this, they have said that this, this is the state of affairs, that given SEBI's restriction, which it has put on itself, therefore it has a problem. Now, that problem can be resolved in various ways, and we'll go into that a little later. But the point here, the purpose of SEBI is to protect the investor, to protect the person who's going to buy and trade on the share market, Adani's shares. Therefore, the PMLA requirement is actually just a convenience which they used for their purpose and why they did that and went away from the much more stricter requirements that means telling us the chain of the money till the last step which would have laid and bare. What the SEBI earlier itself used to call the UBO or the ultimate beneficial, beneficial owner. owner. The ultimate beneficent owner. So why did they give that up? That is an explanation SEBI owes to all of us. Absolutely. Okay. And, 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 and I believe seriously that the Supreme Court has, has to uh, ask these questions. And, and, and you know, I'll go a step further. There is nothing preventing the government of India. There is nothing preventing the parliament to take these issues up and absolutely. say, we want to know who the ultimate beneficent owner is in this particular case. And I will say even further that given this controversy has arisen, Adani owes it to its shareholders to tell us Absolutely. who the ultimate beneficent owners yes, are. This is in the public interest. It can be very convincingly argued. Let me take two steps back. When this report, which was presented on the 2nd of, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the report is dated 6th of May, but it entered the public domain on the 19th of May, and it's like widely circulated. The reactions were predictably around two lines. Take the question, say, NDTV, New Delhi Television, which is now part of the Adani Group. It says, Supreme Court Committee gives clean shit. Several people in the social media said, now it's as if the Adani group has been given a clean shit by this report. But on the other hand, you say, take the Congress party. The Congress party, the spokesperson of the Congress party, Supriya Srinath, Srinath, on the 19th, she pointed out that the report does not provide any answer to the question, Ki, where did this 20,000 crore rupees of funds come in? That the entities are what are called opaque, is acknowledged. So the question is, 
it's a half full and half empty story. We are seeing the beginning and the question that would arise, has the committee overstepped its limit? Is it trying to formulate some sort, as my colleague Abid Das Gupta argues, a legal theory, whereas it should be focused more on the facts? And that, in a sense, undermines. Yeah. You know, it, it, say 173 pages, let's not take a paragraph up here and there and go into that interpretation. The question here is, very clearly, the committee has stated, we do not know who the ultimate beneficent owners are. We do not know how SEBI can find it because this is the nature of the beast at the moment. This is what the uh, SEBI itself has done. It has not passed an opinion. Why did SEBI do it? Well, should it have done it at all in the interest of what is would be called the shareholders? None of these things have been a clear answer has come from the committee. Those answers are what Supreme Court has to do. These are not answers the committee has to give. It's the answers the Supreme Court has to Absolutely go. correct. And larger issue, the public interest, which you have rightly pointed out, the public interest is there are 42 fund managers. There are 13 entities, okay? Who are they? Who do they represent? And if the Hindenburg's uh, reports, conje conjectures, evidence, whatever you might like to call it, if that has to be gone into, then the question is, there is a huge question mark. Okay, here, this. let me here point out, this is what Andy Mukherjee, a columnist for Bloomberg, has written in his column, on the, which was published on the 21st of May. And it's a very, very significant part of this report. The committee had asked series of these big international fund managers, I'll name them, JP Morgan Chase and Company, Goldman Sachs Group Incorporated, Citigroup Incorporated, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, asked them to come and present their views before the committee. Obviously, there were some questions they had. But to quote the report of the committee, none of the international securities funds, sorry, none of the international securities firms and banks were desirous of engaging in the matter. It's stated in its own submission. This is the report. Now the question is, why should a bank or, or a fund manager who's operating out of Wall, uh, Wall Street, uh, you know, um, and this is the question that Andy Mukherjee raised, uh, with an important sort of emerging market franchise to pro go anywhere, this is the exact words, why should a Wall Street bank with an important emerging market franchise to protect go anywhere near a political hot potato? You know, until Paul, it's Jack, compelled. Paul Jack, I'll go a step further. Yes. We know the business of these banks is precisely to bypass regulatory requirements. Their whole game, how can we, in fact, let's put it the other way around, how can we game the regulatory requirements and all these companies have been involved. Tax avoidance? Not tax evasion, that thin dividing yeah, line. Yeah, you know, tax evasion and tax uh, avoidance are two sides of the same coin. But more than that, we know Goldman Sachs and the 1MDB uh, stuff that happened in Malaysia. In Malaysia, correct. So, you know, and uh, this is not isolated. There have been n number of these cases involving all these banks in one case or the other. So it would be very much in the, against their interest to come and educate the regulator how they should be controlled. So it's like asking the uh, lion or the tiger to say, how can we have avoidance of your eating our sheep? Okay, so I'll leave that out for the time being. Last question to you. What are the other possibilities if SEVI is toothless, as it seems to be, the expert committee seems to be saying, well, then doesn't it increase the demand, increase the importance that it should be a parliamentary, a joint parliamentary committee should be formed to see how the Indian shareholders are protected from round tripping as well as on share Precisely. market manipulation. Absolutely correct. And let me explain why. Because this committee, which was set up by the Supreme Court, was looking into whether there had been regulatory failure on the part of SEBI. What about the other agencies of the government? What about the DRI, the Directorate of Revenue Intelligence, which is part of the Ministry of Finance, is the intelligence wing, which looked 
had allegations of evasion or tax evasion or you know money laundering uh, in customs duty what about the income tax department did have they been cooperate what about the cbi the central bureau of investigation have they been coordinating their efforts have they been now certain suggestions which already come out but there is a lot of information already into in the public domain on allegations of over invoicing now some of these cases have been given uh, have been settled in courts but again there is appeal process there is an appellate process yeah, but what is at but this the, point the, the question i'm making is these have to be considered and these can only be considered by a joint parliament yeah, I, I would be more restricted in saying just if this is the statement of the committee sebi does not have the powers given to it at, as of now to be able to investigate the issue of the ultimate beneficial owner then it therefore means it strengthens the argument to have a joint parliamentary Absolutely. committee which it has more powers to do it at the moment i'm not going into other issues of adani empire because we have as you know maybe we'll have another discussion not only that we are into litigation with them anyway as you know, <laughs> you know okay that. you and i okay. both are let, let, okay let's let, stop there no no, no okay. let, let me mention on the record i'm the only citizen of india against whom mr adani's lawyers have currently have engaged us in 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 six defamation cases you are involved in three of them yes so i was not naming them but i was just leaving it open so we don't want to come out as anti adani and going after them all or, we are saying is committing com to contempt of court all all we are saying is that this report seems to strengthen the argument for a joint parliamentary committee to examine the allegations that have been made by the hindenburg report that these are parties which are related parties and therefore the indian stock market needs to know whether this is true or not and joint parliamentary committee will help if it is not true it will help the adani empire if it is true well then whatever decisions have to be taken that have to be taken with this i'm going to finish today's discussion thank you for thank you very much with us yes this is a it's certainly an important topic to talk about not only sebi's powers but the way sebi investigates such issues as you know these are the issues which have also led and in the past and changes its rules and also led in the past to the reformation of sebi ketan right. parik case harshad mehta case all of these are cases which actually have made a change in the way indian stock market That the jpc committees improved the working of the system made it more transparent that's all we have time we have today for discussing such issues we'll promise that we'll come back to you as these issues progress and we get further information further discussions can take place on this and this is something that for joy will probably be with you again